Lead nitrate is one of the few lead compounds that is soluble in water, and as such, it is often used as a precursor for other lead compounds. At room temperature, just under 600 grams are soluble per liter of water. Boiling water can dissolve more than 1.2 kilograms of lead nitrate, and even at zero degrees Celsius, almost 400 grams remain dissolved per liter. Lead nitrate is most often prepared by dissolving lead metal or lead oxide nitric acid. Since it's not very soluble in nitric acid, crystals of the nitrate salt precipitate readily during the dissolution process. Lead acetate is the only other common lead compound that is readily soluble in water. The crystalline product I have clumps up very easily in storage, but it also breaks up readily. It's very dense, and it seems like the clumping is just gravity pulling the crystals together, rather than absorption of moisture or any of the other reasons that things tend to clump. In a break from tradition, when I purchased this material, I actually used it right away. Using this 0.5 molar solution, I built a galvanic cell. Unfortunately, I was unable to find the photos I took of the process, but as soon as I publish this, I'm sure they'll turn up. The most common use in chemistry labs is the reaction between lead nitrate and iodide ions. In this case, I'm using a solution of sodium iodide. It's colored because of its age, surprise, surprise, but it still does the job. This nice yellow precipitate is lead iodide. This is a pretty reaction and all, but everyone does it in chemistry class, so I'm going to do things a little differently. It's going to start with this petri dish and a little distilled water. To the left, to the left side, I'm adding a little scoop of solid lead nitrate. That'll start dissolving, and here's a scoop of potassium iodide on the right. Now watch what happens. Very quickly, a little bit of the yellow color shows up near the lead nitrate and begins to spread rapidly. You can also see that the potassium iodide dissolves completely much faster. The iodide ions seem to be moving toward the lead ions quicker than the other way around. The crystals are forming a little bit slower, so they have a chance to grow and shine a little more than when you just dump the two solutions together. You end up with a pretty effect. Iodine is a big heavy atom, but this is a nice demonstration that shows that the lead atom is bigger and heavier. Within about a minute, the lead nitrate is no longer visible. So I'm not sure if it's completely dissolved or not, but there's an awful lot of lead iodide in there anyway. This is another cool demonstration featuring this reaction. To prepare, I ground up some lead nitrate and potassium iodide separately, and they're going to be combined as solids in this little glass jar. I've sped this part up because it honestly took way too long for me to get the lead nitrate into the jar. It would have been a good time for a funnel, but I was trying to minimize the things contaminated with lead. The potassium iodide went a lot easier. Most reactions between inorganic compounds need to be in water or some other medium to get going. By vigorously shaking these two white solids together, for less than a minute I might add, there is a very pronounced color in the resulting mixture. It isn't as bright as lead iodide, but it's not pure lead iodide. So here we have the same reaction done three different ways. What I did tell you is that each of these reactions were done using the correct stoichiometry. The next step is to combine the products and see just how much lead iodide we've made here. Lead iodide has a few interesting properties in and of itself, the most interesting of which, in my opinion, is thermochromism. I'm planning on keeping the product, and eventually I'll play with it a little bit more. While lead chromate is the more common yellow lead pigment, the iodide has also been used. Since I seem to be gathering a collection of paint pigments, why not add this to the bunch? 
I'm going to stir it for a while to make sure the reaction is complete, and then I'll turn up the heat to see about recrystallizing it. In the meantime, since this is such a common reaction, let's talk about it real quick. Lead's most common oxidation state is plus 2, and the nitrate is no exception. Since the alkali iodides we're using here, be they potassium or sodium, there needs to be two equivalents for the reaction to go to completion. Lead iodide is only slightly soluble in water, and the difference in solubility between boiling water and water at 0 degrees Celsius makes that the perfect recrystallization solvent. And the crystals formed are stunning, as I'll demonstrate in a moment. There is an awful lot of lead iodide here, and the stirrer is having a hard time keeping up. I'm stirring it manually, and pretty soon after, the stir bar gets bound up again and the product starts to settle. Fast. Being a compound of two very heavy elements, it's no surprise that the density is more than 6 grams per cubic centimeter. I had the brilliant idea to try and dissolve all of this in 500 milliliters of water. I left it cook for a while, and in this shot you can see that the amount of lead nitrate has reduced significantly. I thought that transferring it all to a larger beaker and doubling the water would be sufficient. Well, it wasn't. All I did was increase the volume of lead waste I'll have to deal with later. Eventually, after an hour of boiling, I gave up, filtered off the undissolved product, and left this to cool for a while. After another half hour or so, I wasn't disappointed. The crystals form slowly, and they float to the bottom as what is typically called golden rain. What isn't so pretty, however, is the mess. This beaker is coated with lead iodide, and it's a real pain to clean off. The stir bar is another great example. I remember in school that everyone would put yellow test tubes back in the drawer and contaminate everything. One place had a collection bucket for the test tubes. I don't know if they threw them away or if they cleaned them or what happened. It's actually easy to clean if you have the right solvent. A solution of sodium thiosulfate dissolves this stuff right up. This is the same beaker after a little work and it's good as new, except for the stuff on the outside. I'll get that in a minute. Another side note on the mess, the stains on the table leave no doubt you're working with an iodine salt. Anyway, here's the crude product that I'll leave to dry. The beaker with the recrystallized product is going to go in the fridge overnight, and then I'll filter that off too. Here we are the next morning with the crude product that's nice and dry. There's 19.21 grams here. And then here's the shiny recrystallized lead iodide. There's an additional 1.1 grams for a total of 20.31 grams. I'm going to combine it for storage. All told, this is an 83.5% yield. It should be quantitative, but there was an awful lot of loss on the filter paper. I probably could have scraped more off, but that would produce lead iodide dust, and I'm not into breathing that. As common as the lead iodide reaction is, it's certainly not the only reaction. I have here about 50 milliliters of water, and I'm going to add these 4.86 grams of potassium chromate and stir it until it all dissolves. I'm going to add 50 milliliters of a 0.5 molar solution of lead nitrate, slowly so as not to overwhelm the stirrer. I have a little excess of the lead nitrate, so all the chromium is reacted. That way, once I recover the lead chromate, I'll only have to treat the resulting solution as lead waste. I let it stir for a while to make sure that the reaction went to completion, and as soon as I stop the stirring, you can see how quickly the lead chromate falls. This is about half a minute later, and you can see that the top layer is completely colorless, which means all of our chromium is reacted. That's good. This was a little less cooperative in the drying process, and I'm left with these chunks. Lead chromate is used as the main pigment in yellow pavement markings, 
and it used to be the primary component of school bus yellow paint. I ended up with 9.3 grams, which is more than I should have. The white junk you can see on the spatula is probably excess lead nitrate, and that biased the yield a bit high. If I ever plan to use this, I'll probably wash it a couple times to get a purer product. Next up is the lead compound that gave lead paint its name. Here's another 50 milliliters of the 0.5 molar lead nitrate to start, and I'm adding the proper equivalent of a sodium carbonate solution. This will produce basic lead carbonate, also known as white lead. Here's a picture from back in the day when lead in your paint was a selling feature. Oh, how the times have changed. This was really tenacious and took quite a bit of scraping to get it free from the petri dish. One of the procedures I found said that mixing the wet product with linseed oil would serve the dual purpose of driving out the water and formulating the paint. I see now why they skipped air drying. This is the formula for basic lead carbonate. A pure lead carbonate can be produced, but it can only be made by passing carbon dioxide through a solution of lead acetate or by shaking a suspension of lead acetate or nitrate with ammonium carbonate. Both of these processes have to take place at low temperature or the basic carbonate will be formed instead. I recovered 7.11 grams. I wasn't able to find a good equation for the reaction, mainly because I didn't look, so I'm not sure what kind of yield that is. I'm happy with it, and that's all that matters. Okay, here's another 50 milliliter portion of lead nitrate. I ordered some magnesium turnings from eBay a couple years ago, and I'm pretty sure they're a magnesium alloy. I burned a few pieces, and they do burn, but much slower than pure magnesium. Anyway, I suspect it's magnesium aluminum, and both of those should replace lead, so it's not a big deal in this reaction. There wasn't a violent reaction, so I figured... Let's get this party started. I didn't measure the mass or anything, so this is basically just for fun. There is a slight delay to the reaction getting started, but lead crystals do start to form and there's an evolution of gas. I'm guessing hydrogen. After mashing it around for a little while, I just left it to sit and react for a couple minutes, I'd say. And then I wanted to come back and give it another stir and see what happened in that amount of time. And what happened is we get this murky colored solution and all the lead now metal has fallen to the bottom of the beaker. You can still see some chunks of magnesium and aluminum floating around, so since this is just for fun, I'm going to see if I can get rid of them. Now that I have it stirring, you can see the little bits of magnesium aluminum alloy still floating around in there a lot clearer. I'm going to start the process with some washing. I decant off the nasty colored liquid, being careful not to let any of the solids fall into the waste beaker. Then I add about 30 milliliters of distilled water, shake it around, let the solids settle, decant, and repeat that a bunch of times. When I'm satisfied with washing, I add a little 6 molar hydrochloric acid and let it react with the magnesium aluminum alloy, giving the soluble chlorides. I kept adding small portions of acid until the point the reaction seems to have stopped. Then I go through the decant and wash process again until the solution is a neutral pH. I forgot to film the final product, but I got 1.84 grams of what I presume to be mostly lead metal. The last reaction I have in this video is to prepare another lead compound I plan on using in the future. I'm starting by dissolving 33.1 grams of lead nitrate in water. It takes a few minutes to dissolve completely. Once it does, I crank up the stirring and start slowly adding 18 milliliters of 6 molar hydrochloric acid. This is a slight excess, again in the hopes to react as much of the lead as possible. In my research for this video, I found that lead chloride participates in a few interesting reactions, 
so I'm intending to make a little more than I made of the pigments. When I turn off the stirring, you can see how heavy this stuff is. Oh wow, that's heavy. I was impressed with how quickly it settled out. That's heavy. Really impressed. This is the dried product. It has a really strange feel. I got a measly 12.05 grams out of an expected 27.8. I don't want to admit the 43% yield, but I will anyway. I can't blame this on the filter paper because it's separated very cleanly. The solubility is a bit higher than I expected at 10.8 grams per liter at room temperature, but at worst that's a gram. I can't confirm that there might be increased solubility in hydrochloric acid solution though. I'm not sure, but I'm not happy with this yield. Well, it's that time again. Let's see what the hat gives me for the next video. It only gave me one. It's impressive. Calcium sulfate. All right. Well, I feel like the next video is going to be a little less science fair and a little more art project. Before I go, I'd like to mention that lead is extremely toxic and it should not be disposed of down the drain under any circumstances. I collected all of the lead containing waste I generated in the filming of this video for proper treatment. If you work with lead or other heavy metals, please be responsible about the waste you generate. Thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you next time.